Nashville. Mountain saying the same thing John Wayne had always said. If you're right, you kill him. I'm not for anybody who tells me to turn the other cheek when a cracker is busting up my jaw. He had a message, and the message was to people. And the message happened to have been to black people. And some people said, well, you know, that's racist. No, you have to look at me. Freedom is something you have to do for you. How could so you? There was a conviction in him. And then when I began to understand what he had been before, he'd been a pimp. He'd been a hormone. He'd been a druggie. He'd been a drug dealer. He'd spent time in jail. I heard shots, and I saw people crawling on the floor. I knew they had shot my husband. I have no doubt that the assassination of Malcolm X was planned by agencies at the highest level of this government. I don't have any question. I don't have any doubt in my mind. Malcolm X. His image is everywhere today. Was he some kind of hero or just some kind of hellraiser? In many respects, he is much bigger now than when he lived. Good evening. I'm Dan Rather. I heard Malcolm X speak only once here in Harlem, but I will never forget it. His speech shocked, frightened, inspired. When he was murdered, a few steps from where I'm standing, I wondered, like so many, how could they? Who were they? Tonight, we try to answer those questions, and through his own words and those who were closest to him, uncover the real Malcolm X. When a criminal starts misusing me, I am going to use whatever necessary to get that criminal off my back. And the injustice that has been inflicted upon Negroes in this country by Uncle Sam is criminal. Don't blame a cracker in Georgia for your injustices. The government is responsible for the injustices. The government can bring these injustices to home. His real name was Malcolm Little. At least that was the name he was given when he was born in Omaha in 1925. Malcolm's family learned early to fight fire with fire. The Klan threatened to burn his home when his mother was pregnant with him. But Malcolm's father refused to be intimidated. When Malcolm was six, his father was killed. The family believes by white supremacists. The official record called it a suicide. Malcolm's mother never recovered. He was a mess. He was a real honest goodness mess. Ella Collins, Malcolm's half-sister in Boston, became his surrogate mother. I was looking for him to be congenial in every way, mind wide open. And we could do things together, work together, plan, use our brain together, and grow. But Malcolm had other ideas. All he was thinking about at 15 were the sweet pleasures of youth. What about this contention that you are the one that took Malcolm X, showed Malcolm X, the street life, how to make it on the street. I showed him the street life? It's the other way around. <laughs> he showed it to me. The only thing I showed Malcolm X was where to go dancing and have a good time. Any club where Big Ben was playing, we went in. And that's how him and I really got to be tight. We was crazy about flying home. <laughs> he liked stardust. You know, I'll spray those songs for him, you know. I used to admire him when he came to Boston in those days because he was dressed in a zoot suit with the uh, long chain, a 16-inch bottom with a 30, 30, 34-inch leg in the waist and in the, in the knee. And, the, and all the fellas, including myself, we were all jealous <laughs> because he could attract the girls, but we couldn't. Malcolm X was a very kind of down-and-out street guy, uh, uh, really a thug. Had a little burglary ring in Boston. God bless really him. a thug? Is that a fact? Yeah, sure. A thug and a hustler. Went to prison in Massachusetts doing time for a burglary. We both had discussed this thing and made up our minds that we were not going to come out of prison as stupid as we went in. Malcolm's partner in crime and prison was his old pal, Malcolm Jarvis. He and I studied many, many hours, many, many nights. We sat, uh, his room was across the hall from mine, and we had a nightlight. We'd sit by the door reading till 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. History, mythology, 
psychiatry, psychology, we study theology, anything we could get our hands on pertaining to the knowledge of the world, we wanted to know. And uh, while he was in prison, one of his brothers who had become a convert to uh, the Nation of Islam came to visit him and talk to him about it. And Malcolm had what amounted to the beginnings of a conversion experience. The Nation of Islam was a magnificent help to young black men and young black women in the 60s. It was wonderful. People who had had low esteem or no esteem, self-esteem, were uh, dressing in suits with ties. Clean cut, strictly disciplined, the Nation of Islam was also a highly secret and closely knit organization that preached the racial superiority of blacks and urged separation from whites. Its leader was a man named Elijah Muhammad. As a minister in the Nation of Islam, Malcolm becomes a committed member of that nation and a minister totally, absolutely devoted to Elijah Muhammad. It was only about 400 people in the Nation of Islam when Malcolm got out of prison in 1952 and began his intensive recruitment. It was Malcolm X and his recruiting efforts which enlarged the Nation of Islam certainly from 400 to in the thousands. We have come to hear and to see the greatest and the wisest and most fearless black man in America today. Elijah Muhammad seeing the creative work that he, had, he was doing in recruiting so many people into the nation, he appointed him to become the head minister of Temple Number no. 7 here in New York City. You always wanted to be in New York. He felt that New York was one of the greatest cities on earth. And that's where he wanted to be. He used to say that uh, Harlem had the greatest concentration of black people uh, in the world. And so therefore he wanted to be there. I was with Lionel Hampton's band. I was about 19 years old. And maybe 18. And uh, we used to see him all the time during those days. And every time I came to the Apollo, Malcolm was at the Apollo. Do you remember what he what he laughed at? What kinds of jokes, what kind of stories you like to tell or you like to hear? When he would come to my shows, Malcolm would just laugh all over. Not just, I mean, all over. And he'd come back and he'd, oh, God. He was not motivated externally, but internally. And that's the big difference, you know, when you are, are not a, you're not a, a reactor, but you're an actor. And uh, even to the name change, you know, that, that impressed me a lot. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. My father got his last name from his grandfather, and his grandfather got it from his grandfather, who got it from the slave master. The real names of our people were destroyed well, during slavery. Any, I was blessed names? because I got to know Malcolm after the camera was off. And if he walked up to a white person in the street, he'd say, yes, sir, or no, sir. That was Malcolm. He was very manable. But once that television camera came on, Malcolm became Malcolm. Coming up, the spectacular rise and fall of Malcolm X. If you go to jail, so what? If you pass, you were born in jail. Uh, I used to be a burglar, and I burglarized the home, and when I was a Christian, I was a burglar. When Malcolm became converted to the nation of Islam. From 1946, when he was in prison, till he married Betty in 1958, Malcolm totally abstained from any sexual relationship with women. Malcolm was um, uh, very strict with himself primarily because he had gotten off uh, the beaten path. And he was forever compensating to make up to society for what it was that he had done. And he was, he was a good person. You must remember exactly when and how he asked you to marry him. He didn't say, will you marry me? He just asked me quite colloquially, 
if I was ready to make that move. And of course, uh, I understood exactly what he meant. And I dropped the phone and screamed to the top of my voice. This is the uh, wake up process. Let us know who we are. Let us know what names and the language of our forefathers were. Let us know something about the culture of our own kind. He had a message, and the message was to people. And the message happened to have been to black people. You know, he used to, was on the radio every weekend. And uh, a lot of people who listened had never heard this before, you know, with such passion. Malcolm X standing in front of the Teresa Hotel could take a profound political principle and make everybody in the audience, whether you had a PhD or a second grade education, make it understand what he was saying about the condition of black people in America. You haven't done the right thing by my people. And because you haven't done the right thing by my people, now I got to do the right thing by you. Malcolm was a good wolf ticket for all of us who was cowards. Malcolm was John Wayne. Malcolm was all of my heroes. Malcolm came right out of every Hollywood movie. He looked him right in the eye and said, this is the way we're going to deal with it. And we loved him for that. When you got your own country, you can stand up. When you got your own land, you can stand up. When you have your own businesses, you can stand up. When you have your own government, you got something to stand up for. As long as Malcolm was uh, speaking separations, he was not dangerous then because this idea was not going anyplace in the black community. They might applaud it in an audience. But after the meeting was over, they would forget it until the next time they heard Malcolm. Mr. Hoover, will you have any comment at this time? But on Malcolm's your... message was not lost on one audience and one man in particular. So far as the rank and file of the colored population is concerned, maybe some of them do not like the FBI. In J. Edgar Hoover's day, the FBI got a little crazy on the subject of black people. They had Elijah Muhammad under surveillance for at least 20, 25 years. Uh, they had Malcolm under surveillance for most of his public life. Uh, when I say surveillance, I'm talking about wiretaps, I'm talking about room bugs, I'm talking about uh, infiltrators. We knew that we were honeycombed with informants and spies, police and everything, we knew that. We knew it, but what, you, what, what are you going to do, stop? You were an undercover agent for the police. He didn't know then. No, he didn't. And you got in close, very close. He trusted you. I would say yes. Gene Roberts got so close that he became Malcolm X's bodyguard, even though he was really an undercover cop in the New York City Police Department. Your job was to gather intelligence, to gather information. Yes. And the Bureau's mission was to keep tabs on potentially violent people? Yes. Why was Malcolm X considered a potentially violent, if not in fact violent, person? Well, I guess at that point in time, uh, society wasn't ready for Malcolm X. Uh, he was saying a lot of things that um, society didn't want to hear at that point in time. Because of the uh, talk about uh, um white devils because of the uh, existence of a sort of paramilitary force within the nation of Islam. Hoover saw it as an army threatening to the peace and good order of white America. Uh, and he decided they were a subversive group. I had never heard about the nation of Islam. I had not heard about Malcolm X. A man by the name of Louis Lomax came to me. I was working local television here in New York. He said, there's an outfit called the Nation of Islam that you've probably not ever heard about. They have maybe somewhere between a hundred and a quarter of a million members, and they want a separate state. They want black separation from whites. And they hate, they hate white people. They are convinced that there's been a conspiracy against black people by white people, and they are selling this to young blacks and they are doing an extraordinary job of attracting attention. A group of Negro dissenters is We put a program on the air called The Hate That Hate Produced, and it really was, caused a bit of a sensation. To preach a gospel of hate that would set off a federal investigation if it were preached by Southern whites. What are they saying? Listen. 
the black man by nature is divine. Now does this mean that the white man by nature is evil? By nature he is other than divine. Well now does this mean that he's evil? Can he do good? By nature he is evil. I had a confrontation with Malcolm shortly after that film came out on a late night radio show, the Barry Gray Show in uh, New York. Uh, I did not know what to expect when I uh, was to meet Malcolm there. I thought perhaps on the basis of what I had seen in um, The Hate That Hate Produced, I would meet a loudmouth fool. Well, I was wrong. He was loudmouth, all right. He had a loud voice and he used it effectively, but he was no fool. I didn't know what to think about Malcolm at the beginning. Uh, I, I remained skeptical, but there was something strange and special about Malcolm then. He was a good-looking man. There was a, there was a spark in him. There was a conviction in him. And then when I began to understand what he had been before, he'd been a pimp. He'd been a whoremonger. He'd been a druggie. He'd been a drug dealer. He had spent time in jail. And he had educated himself in the image of the man he called the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I think he was a media genius. Uh, I think he was, uh, I think he understood media politics before uh, white elective politicians uh, figured it out. Uh, uh, I think it was part of his undoing, but I think he understood it and uh, knew how to use it, knew, knew how to do sound bites before anybody knew what sound, anybody, any civilians knew what sound bites were. Uh, and uh, his use of them was, you know, saying outrageous things, and there was, would, would always be somebody sticking a mic in front of him saying, say something outrageous. I frankly believe that every Negro in the country should learn judo and karate. You are better than the white man. In the presence of powerful people, the air crackles with energy. And you almost don't want to take your eyes off the person. Malcolm was great. He had that energy, the charisma. Malcolm X has more guts than all of them put together because Malcolm X has the guts to say what he wants to say. Malcolm scared people. There was something sinister, there was something frightening about Malcolm and the black Muslims. They wanted to separate from the white community. And there was always the hint of violence when Malcolm said, by any means necessary. What that was taken to mean was, if we need the gun, we've got the gun. But as Malcolm X drew more attention from the crowds and the media, he began to eclipse the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Some of the true believers resented that. Some, like Yusuf Shaw, were furious. I'm speaking with you because there are so many things that have been written, and many things that I read that are false. I knew he was on the collision course. The media, the cameras, the microphones, the lights, you know, it's a narcotic. He loved them. Not did he like them, he loved them. He reverenced them. The Nation of Islam, national staff, had uh, very strong key figures who were jealous of Malcolm's popularity and influence and power. I called him a Benedict Arnold. And that's exactly what he was. Coming up, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. What did they really think of each other? 1963 was a turnaround year for the country and for Malcolm X. Early in the year, Malcolm discovered a terrible crack in the rigid nation of Islam. He learned that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a married man, the man Malcolm X thought was beyond reproach, was romancing his own secretaries. Malcolm came to me at CBS, came to my office and said, listen, I'm going to tell you a story that you're probably not going to believe. Who was the father of all of these various children you have enumerated? Uh, the first one to tell me who the father was was Wallace Muhammad, and he told me that the father was Elijah Muhammad himself. And then I questioned the sisters myself, because it, I was shook up. And they admitted to me that Elijah Muhammad was the father of their children. He was shocked. He was shocked. He, he felt guilty himself. He had betrayed the 
believers and black people as a whole. He looked like a fool. He had projected Elijah Muhammad as being a upright, uh, righteous person. And I took it to him. In April, that that torn by these revelations, Malcolm X Muhammad. met with Elijah Muhammad and confronted him directly with these charges of his infidelity. He was At the end of the meeting, Malcolm David. promised Elijah Muhammad he would say no more about it, but he couldn't help himself. Malcolm had tried within the nation of Islam to spread the word among people he trusted that they might have a, a very serious PR problem coming down the track if this ever came to light. He told me, he said, the nation is finished. He said, you can forget about it. I said, no, no, it ain't finished. I said, we not finished. I said, that's what you think. And that's when he really got upset with me because he didn't like for you to talk back to him. The people he told blew the whistle. They called Chicago, which was the national headquarters of the uh, nation of Islam. It was only going to injure us. And so therefore, if he, if he was saying something behind Mr. Muhammad's back, and that we were going to, uh, I was going to let Mr. Muhammad know so Mr. Muhammad would call him and find out what he was saying. And that's why I did it. Malcolm X uh, had committed what in the Nation of Islam was uh, a very serious offense. He had made himself a hypocrite, their word. He had blasphemed against the last messenger of Allah, Elijah Muhammad. To all around him at this time, it was clear Malcolm X could not remain in the narrow ideology which had bound him. He was bursting at the seams. By April, while Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad were struggling with one another, the civil rights movement was exploding. And against the wishes of Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm ached to be part of it. I'm one of 22 million black people in this country who is absolutely impatient and disenchanted and fed up when I have to look at the television every night and see police dogs biting our people or see policemen cutting our people or see our women and our children being washed down the sewer with fire hoses. On this crucial day in the history of the civil rights movement, Malcolm X sat frustrated off stage, yearning to turn the movement in his direction. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I saw him the night before the march in a room full of black people. I was the only white guy there. Uh, he was he was being quite civil. He wasn't laughing at the people who had come down uh, for the march, but his disapproval was very clear. His disapproval was very clear, yeah. including disapproval of Dr. King? Yeah. One yeah. day right there in Alabama, a little... He said uh, what King really had uh, was not a dream. Uh, it was a nightmare. Only he was too dumb to know it. Has integration solved the problem or made it worse? When you integrate a white community seeking better housing, history here during the past 10 years has proven that the whites cut out. They flee to the suburbs. Malcolm wanted to be a part of the movement, but King could not relate to Malcolm and his movement because Malcolm's image was so publicly negative in the dominant white society that for King to, uh, to be seen with Malcolm would have undercut much of his support in the white community. He said, many of my supporters would not understand uh, my meeting and working with uh, Malcolm X, they might interpret this as a deviation or an abandonment of my commitment to nonviolence. When Malcolm came down to Selma, he came down to Selma basically almost to say that there was a coalition. Uh, he reassured Coretta and all of us that he was not there to cause trouble, he was not trying to take over the movement. But he thought that if white people saw him there, they would understand that if Martin Luther King didn't succeed, they were going to have to deal with him. I have no argument with Dr. Martin Luther King. He's doing the best he knows how. But what, he, what he's doing is out of style. It's, it's out of date. And anybody who teaches Negroes today to turn the other cheek is, is actually uh, committing a crime. The Civil Rights Bill, which was passed a few months ago, uh, was a marvelous step forward. In 1964, when Martin won the Nobel Prize, and there was a big rally in Harlem at the Armory, Malcolm came to the rally, and Martin and Malcolm did meet 
uh, and spoke briefly. King and Malcolm X actually met twice, with little said between them on both occasions. The two most influential African-American leaders of the 20th century left it at that. Retrospectively, I think it was a, uh, a political mistake. And I think for the, the movement as a whole was a tragedy. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Then, in the fateful fall of 1963, Malcolm X isolated himself even further when he outraged many by referring to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy with the flip comment, it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost, a reference to the spread of hate and violence in America. And now comes the family, the Attorney General, Mrs. Kennedy. Malcolm was given instructions. All Muslims were given instruction to keep your mouth closed. Elijah Muhammad II told him and said, my father uh, said that uh, do not say anything about the assassination of President Kennedy. Because number one, the president was well loved, not only by Caucasians, but by black people too. And we uh, get out and say the wrong thing, you will cause my, pro my followers problems. He is making the remark with regard to Kennedy was, in my mind, just an excuse to come down on him. They were attacking Kennedy in all institutions of government all of the time. Both the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Malcolm were doing it. So certainly that was not the basis for his moving Minister Malcolm out. It's been my view that the real reason was that an alienation that occurred between Minister Malcolm and his leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I run into some discouraged and disillusioned. In, in March 1964, Malcolm X finally quit the Nation of Islam and went out on his own. It was a desperate time for him. Started something called the OAAU, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And I asked him, well, who's your constituency? Who's in there? And he said, well, I don't have many followers. Who's supporting you? Well, I don't have any money. He was a man in search of a platform from which to declaim, in search of his constituency, in search of money, and he was lost. Coming up, who murdered Malcolm X? Malcolm X. Don't think that I don't know how bad I make myself look by attacking an organization that I was once so inseparably a part of. But I'm not particularly concerned with how bad it makes me look. My prime concern is to expose it to the fullest of my ability, let the chips fall where they may. By the beginning of 1964, Malcolm X's rift with the Nation of Islam had widened into a blood feud. Both sides making accusations the other was trying to destroy them. The climate in the community at that time was tragic. Brothers was killing brothers. They would do all these little childish things, you know, come in a restaurant and stand and look at him. He would pull up to a light. Uh, they would run up alongside the car and grab the door like they were going to jump in, you know, and he'd pull off from the light. There were people in the nation also who were so loyal to Elijah Muhammad that, and Malcolm knew, that would kill him at a minute's notice without any reason. He knew what the circumstances were. See, one thing a man got to understand, when you make a Frankenstein, you got to be able to deal with it, otherwise don't make it. In April, perhaps to get away from his painful difficulties at home, Malcolm traveled abroad to Africa and Saudi Arabia. That trip would produce extraordinary changes in his life. Everywhere he went on the continent of Africa, he was received uh, as a kind of official ambassador of black Americans, African Americans. Uh, he was received like a head of state, in fact. He talked to us about the metamorphosis he had experienced. He had gone to Mecca and that he had seen blonde-haired, blue-eyed men who he could call brother. So he had to revise his statement that all whites were blue-eyed devils. In October, in two letters from Saudi Arabia, Malcolm
Malcolm X rejected the philosophy of black racism and called Elijah Muhammad a religious faker. Tonight, Front Page Challenge welcomes the outspoken Negro leader, Malcolm X. Mr. X, may I thank you very much for coming on our program. I think you're a very sincere man, and it takes a lot of courage to, ad, uh, to admit a former belief is wrong. And we I think he changed from the standpoint of manipulating the press, of, of when that camera's on. I have a message that I have to give, and I'm giving it not to white folks, but to black folks. I think after he went to Mecca, he had a message to give to everybody. But when a black man strikes back, He's an extremist. He's supposed to sit passively and have no feelings, be nonviolent, and love his enemy. No matter what kind of attack, be it verbal or otherwise, he's supposed to take it. But if he stands up and in any way tries to defend himself, <laughs> then he's an extremist. Malcolm traveled abroad three times in 1964. He said his mission was to bring the plight of African Americans to the world and eventually the floor of the United Nations. We think that the only way to get uh, America, the racial, uh, the racist element in America to change their attitude is by bringing outside pressure and world pressure to bear. But even as his views were being uh, heard on the world stage, ourselves. Malcolm's dangerous troubles at home seemed to be following him wherever he went. Malcolm was in Egypt when he became violently ill after a meal in a public setting. Uh, uh, there's a lot of folklore that he was poisoned, uh, probably by the CIA. I, I don't quite buy that. Whatever happened to him in Egypt when he was poisoned, he knew there wasn't no Muslims. He knew, he knew Elijah Muhammad's power didn't reach over there. He knew he was going to die by someone's hands, whether it's Elijah Muhammad some government agency or individual forces. He had created a lot of enemies. In fact, by the beginning of 1965, Malcolm X went nowhere without bodyguards. We got into the car and I got into the front seat between two armed drivers. Minister Malcolm got into the back seat between two armed people, shotguns, pistols. Uh, we broke up the meeting and he was going up to the trunk of his car and his bodyguards went to the trunk and took out some rifles and he would say you know he says brother jones he said brother jones and these are these are necessary under these conditions because uh, you know uh, we just have to be very careful february 14th the violence took an even uglier turn when malcolm x's home in queens was firebombed fire marshals in their official report suggested malcolm may have done it himself you know what the degree what temperature was it was about 15 or 20 I stood in my underwear, bare feet, in the middle of my driveway with a gun in my hand for 45 minutes waiting for the police or waiting for the fire department to come. If I want to put on a show, I can find a better way than that to put it on. Malcolm knew he was a marked man. Police offered Malcolm protection. He turned it down, apparently thinking it really didn't matter anymore. The week before he was killed, there was a meeting at the Audubon, and I saw what I thought, and I still think, was a dress rehearsal for um, Malcolm's impending assassination. I called the uh, department the following morning, and I told them that I felt that this was a, as I put it, a dry run, and they told me that, okay, we'll pass it on and we'd take care of it. What they did with it, I, um, I really don't know. I knew he was going to die. I got on a plane and flew to Chicago so I would not be there. I, didn't want to, I did not want to take a chance of being there that day. I just knew he was going to die. I knew. I mean, I could hear it in Malcolm's voice. I mean, Malcolm was frightened. I did not have a gun. But I tell you, I wished I had a gun. Because when I walked into the Ottoman bar room and seen nobody on the door, seen no one there I became very uh, I became very upset and I went direct I, as I walked to the back of the room I asked I said what is this and they said, this is his request. He told us not to put nobody on the door. I said, don't give me that. 
Don't give me that. I said somebody in here is playing games. And a commotion started. Uh, two individuals near the front got up and one of them hollered, uh, get your hands up my pocket. Malcolm said, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And all of a sudden, that's when the bullets and start ringing. I saw three individuals from the front get up and just started firing, firing at him. I heard shots and I saw people crawling on the floor. I saw, and so I got down too. But then when I was looking out and I saw um, someone um, look in amazement to the front, I knew they had shot my husband. And my children were crying, you know, what's going on? What's going on? Are they gonna shoot us? I think that whole process was very painful and uh, I therefore would like if you not have me relive that whole experience. They came running down the middle aisle toward the uh, exit. I turned and went back and two of them passed me. And I met the third individual and just as he turned the fire at me, I turned sideways and hit him with a chair and I knocked him down. Uh, I saw him scramble up, run out the door. I chased him out the door. At which time, uh, when I got out, there was a crowd of people outside. They had, they had him and they were, they were beating him. And I turned around and went back in. And as I got to the stage, he was still laying there and everybody was standing around. So at that time, I started giving him mouth to mouth. And he died right there on stage. Three men, all followers of Elijah Muhammad, were arrested and later convicted of killing Malcolm X. Two of the men, after serving 20 years in prison, have been released and maintain their innocence. The third man remains in jail and, even though he has admitted to the murder, denies receiving any direct order to do it from within the Nation of Islam. None of the three would speak with us for this broadcast. But many still believe that high-ranking members of the Muslim military wing ordered the death of Malcolm X. The followers of Elijah Muhammad occasionally practiced aggressive violence, uh, usually within their own ranks. In your personal opinion, is that what finally killed Malcolm X? It is, yes. Although I think uh, there are some interesting signs of complicity by uh, the FBI. What was the FBI's involvement leading up to Malcolm's assassination? We have now looked at over 50,000 Freedom of Information Act files from the FBI and CIA. They do show prior to Malcolm X's death, the CIA and the State Department were actively monitoring his travels abroad and telling foreign leaders to be wary of him. At the same time, FBI agents were trying to, quote, cause disruption and deepen the dispute between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad by, among other things, forging Malcolm's signature and sending inflammatory letters to Elijah Muhammad and his followers. There are at least 46,000 more pages of FBI documents about the Nation of Islam that have never been revealed. We asked for these documents and were told our request was being processed and would take another two years. There are some who speculate that the government's real role in the assassination is buried in those papers. Knowing what I now know about uh, what the, uh, the illegal activities of the investigative agencies of the United States government with respect to uh, Martin King, for example, and knowing what they did to political parties like the Black Panther parties, I have no doubt that the assassination of Malcolm X was calculatedly, premeditatedly planned uh, uh, by uh, agencies at the highest level of this government. I don't have any question in that. I don't have any doubt in my mind that that's what happened. So my husband said, will be the black Muslim movement and the government uh, who will collaborate in that whole process of killing me. Coming up, Wesley Snipes, Robert Townsend, Keenan Ivory Wayans,
Chuck D. and Public Enemy. What does Malcolm mean to them? Malcolm was our manhood. Actor Ossie Davis delivered the eulogy at Malcolm X's funeral. Our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. In honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. Did you know Malcolm X? No, I didn't know him. I didn't know him personally, but I admired him. The gentleman who's inside represents a uh, portion of American history and will write uh, some of the history of the future. He anticipated the black power movement, uh, which came along uh, a little after he died. He anticipated a lot of the explosion of black, black is beautiful, uh, the Afro haircuts, every, every, all the pride and blackness, I think, had a, had a parent in Malcolm X. The youth now going through a, a cultural revolution where we're trying to get back that same type of spark that black people had in the 60s. Just like somebody would burn an American flag or mutilate a dollar, you'll see a cold-blooded American <laughs> be like, oh, offended. Well, that don't mean nothing to us. But if you know, if you took a picture of Malcolm and like put a, a, a slash across it, you're gonna get in the fight. He's inspired these uh, young brothers and sisters to have a sense of self-pride. This whole movement, which I hope is not a fad, of Mal being Malcolmized and walking around with your kente cloth and a, sen a real sense of your African history, well, a lot of this began with that type of uh, dialogue that he was expressing at that time. I think that in general, the kids on the street with the little X caps and the kids that are tapping into maybe some sort of superficial or surface thing on Malcolm is that Malcolm was a political man, a black man that would not be integrated, would not be stopped, would not sell out. I find in the using of him, uh, the quoting of him, the merchandising of him, I find so much of it obscene. If you got to know Malcolm, Malcolm had a very warm heart. He had a heart just like a baby, really, but you had to get to know him. And that toughness that was on the outer shell that he portrayed was just a camouflage to keep most people to knowing how warm he really was underneath. Most uh, of the young blacks are loving, adoring, worshipping almost, is the pre-Mecca Malcolm. And they're not even aware that there was a post-Mecca Malcolm and that his views were changing. His message of uh, self-determination and not asking anybody for anything, understanding that a right is not something that people give you, it's something that you're born with, and you have to exercise your right. It's like in uh, movies when, when, um, when they call a black person nigger. A black person never has a retort. Watch any movie, they go, say nigger. And then there's no retort. Like, I've got dignity. Can't go there. Got dignity. And Malcolm was like, no, no, no. If you approach me in that way, I will approach you in that way. And that's real. One of the unfortunate things about his death for America, not just for black people, is that Malcolm probably had the best potential insight into the problems of urban crime, of drug abuse, of the kind of things that enslave black people and that right now are bogging down America. I love Malcolm as a brother. And just only in the last four or five years have I forgiven him for dying. I was so furious. I was so furious. We want one thing. We declare our right on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. We'll be right back. 
why get excited when a white man uh, becomes so concerned over Negroes defending themselves? Uh, all the white man has to do is stop brutalizing the Negro, and, he, and then he doesn't have to worry about the Negro doing whatever is necessary to defend himself. It's enough to get you excited. <laughs> Everybody who is black and interested in black people, let us sit down and find out how we can get together in one direction against one enemy and accomplish this job overnight. And, uh, yeah. Have you ever experienced something you can't explain? Saturday, you'll witness the unexplainable in miracles and other wonders. And Sunday, an escaped convict breaks into a lonely woman's home and steals her heart. Catherine Hepburn, in a rare television performance, stars with Ryan O'Neill in The Man Upstairs, a world premiere movie, Sunday on CBS. That's right. This is the uh, wake-up process. Let us know who we are. Let us know what the names and the language of our forefathers were. To order a video cassette of Malcolm X, The Real Story, call 1-800-776-8400. That's 1-800-776-8400. Call now. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to Burrell's Transcripts, Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039. Or call one 800